Good morning, everyone. My name is Gloria Chang, and I'm an associate professor at Weill Cornell in the Division of Neuroradiology. My talk is on toxic metabolic and demyelinating disorders. Case number one, a 30-year-old woman with headaches. We have a coronal T2 flare, as well as coronal T1 postgadolinium images. This is the same patient with sagittal images shown. Findings include T2 hyperintensity and speckled enhancement centered in the hypothalamus. This is a companion case in a different patient with the same clinical entity with T2 hyperintensity in the corpus callosum as well as the cingulate gyri bilaterally. There's also a longitudinal cord lesion in the visualized cervical cord. These are cases of neuromyelitis optica, NMO also known as Devix disease. It is a demyelinating disorder that typically affects the optic nerves and the spinal cord. There are international consensus diagnostic criteria that have been published, which include a serum IgG antibody against aquaporin-4, as well as key clinical characteristics, including optic neuritis, acute myelitis, with cord lesions that are more longitudinal across multiple vertebral segments, and involvement of the brainstem and area postrema. It also involves excluding other diagnoses. This is a diagram that shows that the brain lesions seen in MO differ from multiple sclerosis in the sense that they cluster around the third and fourth ventricles as well as the aqueduct, whereas lesions in multiple sclerosis tend to be along the lateral ventricles. Treatment involves steroids, plasma exchange, as well as long-term immunosuppression. NMO or NMO spectrum disorder, uh, in, in many of these patients, they have this uh, seropositivity for aquaporin-4, but there's also a small subgroup that are seropositive for MOG antibody, myelin oligodendrocytic glycoprotein. This is another companion case uh, of MOG positive NMO spectrum disorder. And on these images, you can see there's perineural optic nerve enhancement. Rather than enhancement of the optic nerve itself, you often see this ill defined fuzzy enhancement along the optic nerve. Patients often have cord lesions that are lower down involving the conus. In terms of demographics, they're more likely to be male, and they tend to have a single attack rather than multiple attacks. Case number two, this is a 10-year-old boy with seizures, coronal T2 flare images, show T2 hyperintense lesions evolving both the white and gray matter as well as the deep gray matter. This is a companion case with axial T2, axial T2 flare as well as sagittal T2 from the cervical spine demonstrating T2 hyperintense lesions in the medulla, bilateral thalami, as well as this longitudinal cord lesion. These are cases of ADEM, acute disseminate encephalomyelitis. This is an immune mediated disease of the myelin. It's often post-infectious or post-vaccine, typically seen in children, although certainly adults can have ADEM. Unlike multiple sclerosis, it tends to be monophasic with all the lesions enhancing at the same time. It can often be more asymmetric than MS, and it doesn't typically have a colossal septal distribution. The initial attack is much more severe, often with fever, seizures, and altered consciousness. Diagnostic criteria from the International Pediatric Multiple Sclerosis Study Group found that encephalopathy was a key diagnostic criterion. And 20% of these patients will go on to develop multiple sclerosis. Case number three is a 50-year-old woman with headaches. T2 flare and T2-weighted imaging demonstrates T2 hyperintense lesions in the corpus callosum as well as the periventricular white matter. This is a case of Susak syndrome, first described by Dr. Susak. 
it's an immune-mediated inflammation of small vessels. But because of the imaging appearance, it can mimic demyelination because of the colossal lesions. There's a classical clinical triad of encephalopathy, hearing loss, and branch retinal artery occlusions. Case number four is a 50-year-old man with multiple medical problems. Axial T2 flare and axial susceptibility weighted imaging. And we have axial diffusion as well as ADC. Demonstrating T2 hyperintensity and reduced diffusion in the splenium of the corpus callosum. There is no abnormal susceptibility to suggest hemorrhage. This is what's known as a reversible splenial lesion. Some people call it a cytotoxic lesion of the corpus callosum or a clock. The key thing is to know that there's a broad differential diagnosis. It can be seen with seizures, various metabolic disorders, including hepatic encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, osmotic demyelination. It can be seen in certain infections as well as medications. Uh, this patient was in the ICU, so it's believed to be secondary to metronidazole toxicity. Case number five is a newborn with a shaking episode with diffusion and the ADC map, demonstrating reduced diffusion in the parietal and occipital white matter, the pulvinar nuclei of the thalami, as well as the globi pallidi. This was a case of hypoglycemia. This infant was found to have a very low serum glucose. A large cohort study published in AJNR demonstrated that this distribution of imaging abnormalities involving the parietal and occipital lobes as well as the pulvinar nuclei as in our patient had a positive predictive value of 82% and a negative predictive value of 78%. Case number six, a 60-year-old man with altered mental status. We have a non-contrast head CT, diffusion, and the ADC map. Demonstrating hypoattenuation and reduced diffusion involving the insular cortex bilaterally, cingulate gyri, parietal lobes, and thalami. This was a case of acute hepatic encephalopathy. The patient was found to have high ammonia levels in the setting of liver failure. This imaging distribution has been described in the literature although you can also have asymmetric involvement of other areas of the cortex, the basal ganglia, thalami, and midbrain. Case number seven is a 30-year-old man with polysubstance use. We have sagittal and axial T2 flare images, diffusion and ADC map zoomed up, demonstrating T2 hyperintensity and reduced diffusion in the dorsal columns at the cervical medullary junction. And this was a case of vitamin B12 deficiency, in this case induced by whippets. Whippets is nitrous oxide toxicity from inhaling whipped cream dispensers. And classically, you get this T2 hyperintensity and reduced diffusion in the dorsal columns. Patients often present with ataxia, which improves with intramuscular injections of vitamin B12. Case number eight is a 65-year-old woman with seizures. We have T2 flare and postgadolinium images. Demonstrating T2 hyperintensity and heterogeneous enhancement centered in the left parahippocampal gyrus. The patient came back two weeks later for her surgical resection, and the brain lab showed that the lesion was now bilateral. On the right, you can also see there was no associated diffusion abnormality. This was a case of perineoplastic limbic encephalitis. The initial scan was called high-grade glioma, and so the patient was scheduled for the OR. Uh, the surgeon was called after the second scan. And because of that, the patient just had a biopsy rather than a full resection. 
In this case, it was biopsy proven perineoplastic limbic encephalitis. Further workup revealed that there was an occult colon cancer. A previous publication reported that about 50% of these cases are associated with lung cancer, the majority of them small cell lung cancer. It is an immune mediated disorder where antibodies formed against the tumor actually target intracellular antigens. Case number nine is a 50-year-old man in jail with syncope. T2 flare and diffusion-weighted imaging demonstrates T2 hyperintensity and reduced diffusion in the mammillary bodies, hypothalamus, and paramedian thalami. This was a case of Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is typically caused by thiamine deficiency in the setting of chronic alcohol use, bowel surgery, vomiting, chemotherapy. There is a classic clinical triad of ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and confusion, although this triad is only seen in 20 to 40% of the cases. It's believed that the thiamine deficient membranes have an altered osmotic gradient, which results in this periventricular edema in this typical distribution. Case number 10 is a 99-year-old woman with metabolic abnormalities. You can see T2 hyperintensity and reduced diffusion in the central pons. And this was a case of central pontine myelinolysis. This is a classic older lady who had hyponatremia from a chronic T and toast diet. It's otherwise known as osmotic demyelination syndrome. It can result from rapid correction of hyponatremia, and it typically has this classic trident appearance. Case number 11 is a 25-year-old man with polysubstance abuse. And you can see diffuse white matter, T2 hyperintensity, very ill-defined, as well as T2 hyperintensity and T1 hypointensity of the posterior limbs of the internal capsules. And this was a case of chasing the dragon or inhalation of heroin vapor. It has this typical distribution with uh, periventricular sort of symmetric, ill-defined diffuse white matter abnormality with sparing of the subcortical U fibers. So in conclusion, this is a very big topic toxic metabolic disorders as well as demyelinating disorders, but distribution often helps you come to the right diagnosis. In the case of demyelinating disease, remember that there's NMO spectrum disorders. Remember the antibodies against aquaporin-4 as well as MOG. Also remember the demyelinating disease mimic, SUSAC syndrome. With metabolic disorders, oftentimes the history can point you in the right direction, or sometimes labs, in addition to the di distribution of the imaging findings. With toxic disorders, again, history is often very helpful. Remember that reversible splenial lesions can occur with a whole host of clinical entities, and it's not specific. And also remember perineoplastic syndromes. Thank you very much for your time.